Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are joining from and from where you're listening from. A warm welcome to this first of our series of lectures, uh, Troubling Psychics. For all of you who joined in last week, you will remember that unfortunately we had to cancel the first lecture due to technical difficulties. Again, our sincere apologies for that. All the more, I'm very, very glad to welcome you today. And also, I am extremely pleased to welcome our two speakers, Kukitsu Moeti and Tobias Matzner, who will be introduced later on. I want to welcome you as well on behalf of all of our cooperation partners of the Institute for Social Research, to name a few, Almut Popinga and Stefan Lessenich, the Institute for Human Geography, namely Timo Dorsch and Susanne Heek, and my colleagues from Medico, Usche Merck and Julia Manek. In short, on behalf of everyone who developed this series, we also welcome and thank all those who are making this series of lectures possible through their great and often invisible work. Andrea Schult, Benjamin Cortes, Lucian Kirschbaum, Miku Broll and Nele Eisbrenner. My name is Anne Jung and I have the great pleasure to welcome you today as head of the Public Relations Department and to give you a short overview to the idea of this lecture series. This series is dedicated to different perspectives of global effect politics and psychosocial struggles in these pandemic times. It is a pandemic that has long since become a polypandemic, a global and multi-layered crisis, a pandemic of poverty and hunger, of nationalism and authoritarianism. It is high time then to think in transnational contexts about ways to reconstruct the world. For Medico, as a co-host of this series, this is a process, a journey, which we started with the big Congress reconstruction of the world in February this year. Trilingality and a place of critical thought with our cooperation partners, our colleagues, critical theorists who inspire us with their new radical and very unusual perspectives on subjectivity. The question of subjects in the pandemic is fundamental for the reconstruction of the world. The series of lectures dares to take a global look at new subjectivities we ask, what did this pandemic do to us? The pandemic has made it physically tangible that there is only one world in which we all live. Therefore, our thinking and our position as speakers must be related to this whole we. In a world in which power is based on ever-changing inequalities, a we remains piecemeal. At the same time, it is a matter of differentiating precisely that we and its extremely different forms of subjectivation. We have to deconstruct and reconstruct this myth of a we at the same time. So what constitutes an empathic we? What creates solidarity if we want to change the world? And what is the longing that unites us? How will we and who will we have become? The pandemic rupture gives new impetus to the desire to leave behind the old normality, the one that makes us sick. Instead of the transformation of, of all living things into immortal property, defended with power and cruelty, a counter-strategy could be pursuing commitment. Change can emerge when desires and feelings change, 
when other forms of subjectivation and struggles develop that banish fear and powerlessness because they awaken the longing for solidarity-based politics, for relationships, for justice and multiplicity beyond capitalist exploitation of nature and bodies. Kroketsu Muiti from South Africa and Tobias Matzner from Germany, who will be opening this evening's lecture, are approaching this question exactly of how solidarity can be fought for and achieved in the digitalized sphere. Although it seems obvious that algorithmization fueled effect politics full of resentment, especially during the pandemic, and also that the bodilessness of the sphere creates loneliness. This topic, effective dynamics in the digital uh, public sphere, will be discussed. With that, I want to hand over to my colleague. Usche, Usche Merck. She's an expert for psychosocial issues and she will be our host for tonight's lecture. Thanks a lot for this introduction. I too am very pleased to welcome you all. And I am especially glad to see you and your our two speakers, Kuketsu Muiti and Tobias Matzner. Koketsu, you are joining us from the US today and Tobias from somewhere in Germany. The digital space makes possible to have transnational global alliances that are very, very beneficial. So thanks a lot for taking the time to join us today. So when it comes to tribal psyches in the pandemic and about what they do to us, the subjects, the question of the role of the digital infrastructure of communication in the public sphere cannot be left out. At the same time, this is a huge topic that can be looked at from many different perspectives. In the following, I would like to outline just a little bit what has been on our minds in preparing today's session what context we are starting from and what questions we have for Koketsu and Tobias. First, we are concerned with grasping the meaning and influence of digital power. What does that mean? As we know, the revenues and profits of tech giants like Facebook, Google, Amazon, etc., they exploded. They are among the big winners of the pandemic. They are the most influential, fastest growing companies in the world and they have absolute market power. So what these companies offer are not neutral platforms. The business model of the digital industry is based on a behaviorist view of human beings. That is the assumption that human subjects are not unpredictable. So what we always assume wanting to change the world but that they are completely measurable and ascertainable. So with the help of algorithmic control, it should thus be possible to elicit effects and the resulting behavior in a predictable way. The basis of the behavior modeling this business model requires is the data of millions of users, which provide the raw material for big data and the development of artificial intelligence. The changes that accompany the rule of tech companies are, according to the economist Shoshana Zuboff, very fundamental. She speaks of a new system of dominance, which she calls surveillance capitalism. According to her, its goal is the domination of the human being. In this, the programming and influence of algorithms have become a central instrument of power. It is being ex expressed in the increase of hatred, irrationality and radical right-wing influence as most recently was revealed by Facebook whistleblower Francis Horn. There is also the rise of a global loneliness crisis, as economist Norina Hertz sp speaks of. 
all in all, we felt that a critical theory of the subject today, that a psychosocial perspective must also address the structure and politics of algorithms. That's why we are very pleased to have Tobias Matzner with us today, an expert speaker who may be able to help us further in this regard. On the other hand, it is of course not only about the production of resentment and loneliness, but also about resistance against digital power and the digital inequality that comes with it. The digital divide has been further exacerbated in the polio pandemic between those who at least have access to digital spaces and those who are further excluded because they have neither sufficient data volume nor stable electricity, digital devices are, or knowledge to be able to establish digital connections and spaces of communication. At the same time, digital spaces have become more than ever the starting point for protests and resistance, whether local or global, like the recent Black Lives Matter movement or the many, many feminist movements. From the perspective of a digital activist from South Africa and beyond, Koketsu Meoeti will talk about how digital space can be appropriated. What approaches to digital radical activism can there possibly be, for example, that enable transnational alliances between the excluded and those who have always been part of and have never been excluded? That's what today's lecture will be about. This is why I want to hand over directly to Tobias Matzner. Tobias, you are Professor of Media Algorithms and Society at the Institute for Media Studies at the University of Paderborn. Your research focuses on the intersection of theories of digital media and technologies and approaches to political philosophy, cultural studies and social theory. Your focus is on the interconnection and interaction of artificial intelligences, concepts of subjectivity, social and normative transformation processes. Your work is, among others, influenced by the works of Hannah Arendt and Michel Foucault. At the moment, you're working on a book with the title Hannah Arendt, Challenges of Plurality. Koketsu, you will be introduced when it's your turn to speak. And right now, I want to hand over to Tobias. Many thanks, and I'm very happy to be a part of this event. I find it so fascinating. And here I am not only to talk as an expert, but also to learn and to get into an exchange. Because this topic is so much broader that, uh, than what I'm talking about in university. So I find that very important. And I was asked to say something very fundamental about effect digital media and algorithms. And probably we will get into this more profoundly about what it means in the pandemic. But we saw in the pandemic that digital media are not to be left out as means of communication for friends, for family, for colleagues, for associations, for everything that has, or every, everything about that has been digitalized in a way. At the same time, digital media reach a very great public. So not only for professional journalists, for example, but principally for everyone. So these two functions, so communication in private life and interaction with people we love that are close to us and the communication with the wider public are very much connected in digital media because firstly it makes a difference if i get a message if i see it on a news website or if that message appears in between pictures of my friends on instagram mainly this connection is there because all the time data about all our digital life is being collected and then it is being used by algorithms to 
create content. So also our private communication is being collected and is being um, evaluated. And I want to talk about those consequences today. Effect is a, an important topic because the danger algorithms pose to the public are often due to effect or that is being said. So we talk about politics of effect. So we think that a certain form of effect is connected closely to algorithms. So now I want to talk about two ideas, the filter bubbles and the alleged danger of digital or algorithmical manipulation. For both, I want to say it is a danger, but it is different from what we understand them normally. So the idea of the filter bubble is algorithms choose content for us that we like, and the consequence is we see only what we like, and we don't come into touch with critical content at all. So the content shifts away from critique and arguments and closer to effect. In a TED talk, there was being said, um, there was a very beautiful presentation. There were many blue uh, people you, uh, who were uh, pulling uh, on a rope, and not. some have an ice cream, it's a picture of an ice cream, and the others have books mm -hmm. they think about in this image. And this theory is wrong on an empirical basis. So a lot of um, communication scientists went out and tried to find those filter, filter bubbles, and they didn't find them. So they found out that people do get in touch with critical context and content, especially in radical groups or with people who are with conspiracy na narratives, um, but they get into very detailed contact with critical content, but of their enemies, but they interpret it in their own way. So it's not about not getting in touch with the other content, but it being not effective. So that shows that this old opposition of reason, of fact, is wrong. What we see in the pandemic is that reason needs something like an effective company. We thought effect doesn't matter when the facts are on the table, but at the moment we see work of science might be done then when the facts are on the table, but work of politics is just starting at that point. So this is a moment of effective conviction. The second example I want to highlight is the way in which algorithms seem as a danger because they pose the danger of manipulation through personalized content. That is connected with the name of Cambridge Analytica, the company that promised we, Ursula Merck said it already, we can evaluate people, we can measure their basic psychological traits and appropriately to that, that those traits are being taken as universal, so five basic character traits uh, that can be measured according to this theory. And according to that, I can create manipulative content. And first of all, there is no real um, record of Cambridge Analytica's work being effective, but that's not what it's about. It's about what Usha said, the behaviorist anthro anthropology. So filter bubbles, as well as this certain anthropology of measurement, they suggest that the danger of algorithms is in being a very direct connection to our psyches and away from reason. So if that was the problem, the problem of algorithms would be a problem of basic human nature. I have a characteristic, it can be measured, algorithms react, that's done. And this narrative has a fundamental problem. This narrative doesn't contain any politics and society. It's only about basic human nature and characteristics that are being connected with everything. Who those people are 
is not being questioned anymore. The content these algorithms transport is not being questioned at, anymore. So we don't talk about an election campaign being racist and using Cambridge Analytica for that, but we only talk about manipulating this uh, these people with the campaign. So we can see this effect over and over again. For example, we saw it when the uh, Yellow West Fest protest started in France. People said it's due to this new Facebook algorithm. So people didn't talk about the political quest of the those people and the legitimacy and what they mean, but it was discussed that they were manipulated and uh, by an algorithm. So the political question was taken out of the discussion. And also, Kuketsumuiti published a very beautiful text three years ago that we shouldn't under forget that Cambridge Analytica and similar campaigns do their work that well because there is a racist structure in society they could connect to. So it doesn't mean that that algorithms are harmless and that it's only a society problem. That's another narrative that is just as wrong. I'll get back to why algorithms are not harmless, but we have to understand, we won't understand their effects when we don't regard the social structures that enable their effectiveness. We see this also in this narrative of, or this history of depolitization is being um, spread by internet platforms. It says, we just wanted to uh, build an algorithm that shows the optimal um, res results for everyone. And all the negative effects, it's just side effects of this primary, very good idea. So we show, everyone what best and for social like with reasons to social dynamics it went a bit wrong and this manipulative hate machine turned out of this algorithm that is wrong because the platform is not in touch with users only and we can sh show every user what they'd like but from the start it's being confronted with people who are beings in societies and cultures and to this society, social and cultural situations um, affect belong to. So that means effects are not merely an animal or a natural um, opponent to reason. They're not they are also not like very strict mechanisms within like behaviorism for example assume that has been addressed earlier or they are not only that that's remains of um opinions from the past that are very effective still so we still have this divide between reason and effect that's very um, that has a lot of influence and we also still assume that reason is something we learn, that arguments is something we learn that develop, while effect is something that just within ourselves that is very old, that is very natural, and that we have to control. And what we don't see in that is that effective reactions also are something that can be learned that can be trained and that develop with the cultural and social situation. That means the way I react to media or to news on the internet doesn't depend only on my filter bubble and it's not only related to if it fits my measurable characteristics, simple characteristics, but my reaction is connected with what I lived through, 
what I have been trained with, uh, about with my plans, with my expectations. And there's beautiful research, for example, from Lorraine Berlin um, that show that that there's this book, Strangers in Their Own Land, and uh, Cruel Optimism by Lauren Berlin. And they are about that this permanent living through being frustrated in your own expectation leads to you creating an effective guard or a protection mechanism, and you don't let things get to you. And still, you continue doing things. You know that they are bad for you, but still you continue doing things. Because life in this permanent um, being on the lower side of power structures, being excluded, feeling the negative consequences of capitalism or racism permanently is cannot be bad, different than just creating a, an inner, just a strategy to handle, to cope. And that's what research showed. So uh, the way I react to message or to news can also be dependent on very personal experiences, traumatic experience, for example. So all of this, all of these are very strong points that have to do with effect. So people who are often excluded from social participation feel in their everyday life that something's wrong with society, but they don't have the possibility to change it directly, and they need what Berland calls cruel optimism. And they need to create those effects and train them. So if someone's susceptible for manipulation, then because content fits those cultural and social affective structures, and it is important that confronted with those structures, so for example, the political situation, the platforms we just talked about are not neutral. So it's not, we say there's a platform and we can communicate this or that via this platform. No, this these platforms are a measurement of certain positions. So they are inherently individualistic. They say you do something and the algorithms will just give you the corresponding result. It's your action, you get the result. It only depends on you. So social structures don't play a role in the mechanism of these platforms. And this perspective is just not right, it's very unidimensional and it's not right. So in reality, a reaction is only dependent on social structures. So when a platform personalizes something, that means the algorithm categorizes something. You create content and that content is categorized with a similar content. And you get to see what people who are similar saw as well. So this alleged individualization is also a categorization. So the anthropology seems liberal, but the reality behind that is not at all. So algorithms are not neutral. The platforms are not neutral because the rhetoric is corresponds to this anthropology, which makes them susceptible for to this depoliticization I talked about. It depends on you, on what you do, on how you behave. And the result of that, we 
can't we can't influence that's just an effect of what you did which is the narrative of those platforms so the second reason why those platforms are not neutral is the amount of advertisement that's the business model who wants to sell advertisement you want to sell a lot of advertisement so the people have to stay on the platform for the longest possible time so we have to optimize the time people spend on those platforms and you fascinate people not only with or not for a long time with complicated detail or complex political questions and when talking about advertisement we are or everything is directed to those who can buy that doesn't mean that algorithms and digital platforms have those characteristics because they are digital but by because they correspond to a specific social situation you can build, build emancipatory platforms you can show so or create solidarity in digital media but you can't rely on a platform being neutral and you just have to do the right thing with it but if you create a platform for emancipation for enlightenment you need another platform and that is probably the best point to hand over to Koketsu Meti because she raised or she created exactly a platform like this and that's why I'll stop here and I'm looking forward to the discussion in the second presentation. Thank you. That was a really good introduction to just explain to us a bit how this complex uh, structure work in between um, algorithms and politics, how we can think this um, together. I hope that in our discussion we will go more in detail then, but before that I'd like to hand over to Kuketsu. Kuketsu, I'm sorry I have to speak in German, that's because of the translation. I'm sorry to speak in German though. We know each other for several years now, and I admire you a lot for all your power and what you build up. You are the founder and the ED of the mobile phone-based action network, Amanda Mobi. You are the founder, you are the director, though, that's what I want to say. So that's a tool that combines um, communities in areas in South Africa to fight against problems like evictions or gender-based uh, violence. There are 200, over 250,000 people who are members in South Africa, especially your income black women who use this tool. I think you can tell us a lot about this tool. But apart from that, you are also founder of the African Digital Rights Network. You got your um, part of international foundations like the Obama Foundation. You are the founder um, fellow of the collection Collective Action in Tech. And you are in a lot of m mobile um, networks in the internet. You're part there. And I'm very excited to listen to you. The floor is yours. Um, so Good evening, everybody. It is really, really exciting to be here with you all at this time. And like Tobias said, you know, I'm hoping that we can learn together, engage each other. Um, there is what we are talking about tonight um, is just one part of a big machinery of a big a machinery that is seeping into our everyday existence in ways that were not foreseen, I think. The rise of digital and other new technologies was met with a lot of enthusiasm um, across the board, you know, different industries and sectors. This was mainly because of the belief that um, it was transformational and that it would have so much democratizing potential. Suddenly, we as people were not passive consumers of news, for example. We created news as well. The enthusiasm was renewed in the wake of the Arab Spring when activists used digital technologies as an organizing tool to amplify their demands. 
And this tradition has continued. As the COVID-19 pandemic sent shockwaves around the world, the civic tech community responded by deploying various technologies to support efforts to confront the crisis. So an example I wanna give you is Anpas, in which is based an organization based in Italy. They used Ushahidi, a free open source platform for crowdsourcing crisis information to ensure there was a steady supply of food, medicine and other subsistence goods to vulnerable communities that were impacted by the restrictions brought by the pandemic. In the space of 13 months, Ushahidi was deployed more than 1,500 times in over, in over 130 countries. Budget is another example of this. It's a civic organization that applies technology to intersect citizen engagement with institutional improvement in Nigeria. This organization launched COVID Fund Tracker. So what the portal did was it tracked COVID-19 related donations um, given to the federal and state governments of the country to monitor, to enable the monitoring of resources and to advocate for accountability. So these are two examples of how technologies have been used you know, in this time of crisis. But we must remember that this is not new, nor is it exceptional, right? In the past, we also saw activists use technologies such as printers, fax machines, and in South Africa, even encryption technology to bypass the surveillance of the apartheid state, right? So it's not a new thing that is happening. Throughout history, technologies have always advanced and people who are opposed to certain things have used them to attempt to change the world in which they live, um, to enable political participation, and in fact, to open up civic space. But as Tobias has pointed out, this is not neutral. The growing adoption of digital technologies and devices in the last two decades, while it has enabled new forms of political participation, it's also extended civic space beyond the physical realm. But in response to these technologies being used to open up civic space, we have seen reactionary actors closing these online spheres through tactics such as internet shutdowns, the expansion of surveillance, and targeted mis and disinformation campaigns. An analysis of the state of digital rights in 10 African countries, for example, identified 65 examples of people opening up democratic spaces online and almost double the number of examples of the civic space being shut down online by governments. And what this makes it very clear is that there's a need to better understand the impact of these evolving technologies on civic space and how civic space has been completely reconfigured by the growth of these digital public spheres. So a few immediate questions that come to mind for me is, who are the various actors involved? What are the terms of participation? not just for users, but for those who deploy these technologies, right? What impact, if any, does the wider social and political landscape have on the impact of digital technologies? And these are just a few questions that can be asked, but very often the available answers are not about the global South and are not about the African continent. So even in our understanding of how digital technologies are reconfiguring civic space, we are focusing on how it is deployed and answering questions about it in just a few parts of the world. And these questions are not only limited to the closing of civic space, but also the opening, right? Um, despite the existence of the digital divide um, across the continent, there's been an increase in digital access um, which has enabled the use of these technologies. An example that comes to mind is on the night of the 20th October, 2020, when Nigerian armed forces shot at INSAR's protesters um, at the Lekki toll gate in Lagos. Allegedly, CCTV cameras were removed from the toll gate before the shooting happened. 
and Nigerian officials denied that anyone was killed. And this could have been the official narrative had it not been for Ansar's protesters who documented the massacre in real time. And it's not the only example that we have where digital technologies and video evidence have proved to be useful for the NSARS movement. Um, what started as an online campaign, it went on to gather over 48 million mentions with 5 million unique authors, shifting the agenda of mainstream media and spilling to the streets to become the biggest and long, longest running protest in a generation. This enabled fundraising for medical care, food, and real-time updates about what was happening in different locations. And beyond this ability to assemble mass audiences, there's a lot to be learned from movements like NSARS about moving beyond short-term viral sensations in the digital space to having a sustained impact. But conversely, during the pandemic, we've also seen an increased shift in the shutting down um, of these democratic spaces. An example of this was in June 4, when the Nigerian government announced it would be suspending Twitter access in the country. While Nigerian officials denied um, it was the reason for the ban, the action came after Twitter deleted a tweet from President Buhari. And this is a platform that has been um, adopted over the years in various ways to expand civic space with, um, pre like with very visible campaigns like Bring Back Our Girls, Occupy Nigeria, and NSARS just being a few. Um, the ban government later announced would be indefinite, um, and which made the platform accessible to Nigerians who bypass government's restrictions through the use of VPNs. And this is not the only instance we saw. We saw an intensified crackdown on free expression. Both new and existing legislation was used to do this. In 2020, in the cloud of a pandemic, governments in over 20 countries passed very vague or broad laws, criminalizing speech that government claimed threatened public health. Others used already existing laws to do this. And in many instances, um, these were used as tools of repression. So for example, in Tanzania, where there was COVID denialism, regulations that, pro that prohibit the publication of and sharing of information on the outbreak of the disease um, were banned. And this was seen as a move to silence those critical of government's poor handling of the pandemic, and also an excuse to introduce repressive measures in the lead up to the country's elections. So suddenly, something that was related to COVID was not only used to repress speech related to COVID, but also extended you know, to clamp down in the lead up to elections. In India, for example, citing the country's Information Technology Act, the government made a legal request to Twitter to take down posts that were critical of government's handling of the pandemic as cases surged. I could go on and on, but what we did see last year, the expansion of um, surveillance through apps um, that were meant to as contact tracing tools, um, and these shutdowns that we also saw, we saw that freedom diminished in a significant number of countries. And actually in 65 countries, um, I mean 45 countries, internet users had been arrested or detained for online um, COVID related speech. Now, as Tobias pointed out, we often talk about these platforms as if they are neutral, you know, they exist, it depends what you are using them for. But the reality is, in a world as unequal as ours, there is nothing that is neutral, right? How these, um, pand how these platforms are used, who uses them, and for what purpose is informed by power. It doesn't just happen. The other thing that happened with the pandemic, for the longest time, people thought that digital access is somehow a universal thing, right? But as the COVID lockdowns and restrictions became a part of life, 
for billions of people across the world. And as activities moved online, it was actually discovered that it's not, even in a developed country such as the US, we suddenly had kids who could not learn online owing to access, both of devices and the infrastructure. And I also really appreciated um, enterprises start off to this conversation because language also matters, right? Despite English being a minority global language, it is still the language of choice online, which by itself excludes so many people. Um, the majority of content that we find online um, is still mainly in languages such as English. And so these are just some of the few, few barriers um, that exist. The pandemic, however, also resuscitated um, what we will call technological solutionism, right? Um, a term that was popularized by the book to save everything click here, the folly of technological solutionism. And this term describes a belief that every problem has a solution based in technology, right? And it's tempting to think of um, in a world so full of problems as for technology as a quick and easy way out where we no longer have to deal with the social and the political structures that create um, what we are reaping but in fact, um, there will be a quick fix that can save it. And one way that we saw that this was not true, contact tracing apps. Um, they were deployed in 50 countries during the pandemic and took up significant resources in the development. But what we saw was there was questionable success, poor uptake, privacy concerns, and no consideration for the digital divide. So in Australia, for example, um, government hailed the two million Australian dollar COVID safe tracing app as its success, owing to the number of people who downloaded it. But it later emerged that the app worked as few as one in four times for some devices. So solutions like this and the turning to technology for solution meant that significant resources which could have been used in other ways, right? Were diverted to build them, to create them, to be hailed as successes, when in fact they did not achieve the outcomes which they were meant to. The other thing that I just want to bring to our attention as well, over the last couple of years, we've had massive discussions about the dangers of the power um, held by the big tech companies. So this would be your Facebook, your Googles, and Amazons, and so on, right? I mean, it's no surprise. There have been revelations about how Facebook deliberately undermined rivals to grow its dom dominance. But what we are ignoring is that big tech companies are not the only ones that we should be scrutinizing. We also have this dangerous duopolistic MasterCard and Visa hegemony, right? Which gives them a lot of power. So the two are payment processes um, that are used, that are mainly used online. So if you were purchasing online, um, you would have had to have a MasterCard and Visa card. But what this does is that um, it gives them power to decide who is able to make money online, right? And increasingly, we are seeing them shift into the space of using their dominance um, to shut down free expression and to shut down a whole range of political action merely by taking away the resources and the funds to be able to do that. So in the same way that it is understood that the business models of tech companies should be regulated, to address the power. The same should be done for industries that are not always obvious players in this digital space, right? But are amassing enough power to influence it. And so it requires regulation of the payment processing industry and infrastructure. Uh, industry, a sector that's important, has been underscored by the move online during this COVID-19 related restrictions. 
Um, and so there's a need to be vigilant, right? To vigilantly guard against corporations like them becoming the overlords of the internet, leaving us at the mercy of those whose only intention is to profit and the whims of those whose agendas they drive. I want to also just add a few other things that we should definitely be thinking about. If anything, COVID-19 has highlighted the need to relinquish this false idea that there is a real offline world and a fake online world. We have repeatedly seen that the consequences of what happens online are felt in this very offline world, right? What happens in this digital realm, whether it's the shutting down or opening up of civic space, has very real consequences that threaten even democracy. So key issues for me, it's important to understand how digital technologies are deployed, um, whose interests um, are they being deployed for, but it's also crucial that we develop the capacity to not only push back, but also advance a different kind of digital realm world and how we engage with it, as well as solutions for public policy and a digital governance agenda that is centered on public interest. We cannot allow corporations merely by virtue of being dominant players in this sector that are not elected by any population to dictate what can and should be online, who can, who cannot make money online, which spaces are being opened and which spaces are being shut down because these are not neutral. These are amplifying the very same inequalities, both racial, economic, that existed in the world long before these platforms ever existed. And digital technologies are not going anywhere. So unless we act now, they will continue to be used by repressive governments and other actors who want to maintain the status quo. And they will also be used to erode any gains that we had made or were on the path to making both during COVID and before. I'll end there and we can open up for engagement, Usha. Sorry, thank you very much, Koketsu. Thank you very much. There's still so much more to say and to ask to you. I think you just opened up the field because now we want to know how do you actually, how do you organize, organize resistance? How do you do it? And what does it mean? And how do you do that in a, in a country like South Africa, where uh, a huge number of people are really fall completely through the cracks and the div digital divide is, is not just a digital one, but it's a real one. Uh, there's an extreme inequality. So I we, what we thought now is maybe that we give the two of you a bit more time to also talk to each other or ask each other and discuss before we open for the public. But just to say, if the public has questions, please put them into the F&Q uh, Frage und Antwort section. Oh, I'm speaking English. Ich bin so... Entschuldigung, ich musste umschalten. Ich habe äh, leider Englisch gesprochen. Das ist mir passiert mir immer, weil ich So I spoke English. Um, I'm sorry for that because I listened to Coquetto. Of course the interpreter said was that. Ich wollte das Publikum bitten, wenn sie Fragen I'd like to ask the public if you have questions then write into the FNQ section. My colleague Jule will summarize it and bring it up into the discussion. So now I'd like to hand over to Tobias to just comment on what Coquetto said and then back to Coquetto to tell us a bit more how, which experience she has with resistance in the digital realm. Tobias. So, um, thanks Coquetto, this was, this was a lot and I think I don't have to say much uh, one imp very important point, I guess, was actually bringing about the payment processors as an example of the structures that we tend to overlook. 
right, that we tend to forget, but which are very strong resources of power. In some countries, also cable providers, network providers, cell phone providers add to that, right? And they can be very complicit sometimes because they're closer to the state, sometimes because they're their own interest network, whatever. So that's a very important point. I'm so grateful that you brought that up. Another one was um, the, the protests that were like, like in Nigeria and the NSARS movement, for example. Um, and here's an example for a more sustained impact. And I would really like to hear more about what you think made that case one where the impact was more than, as you said, just a short viral thing online. And I think it has something to do with the possibility to navigate Twitter and other platforms and offline spaces, although you clearly stated there's no pure offline anymore. But I would really like to hear more about what you think made that case or similar cases more sustainable than others that somehow were super quick online and then just vanished. Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a variety of things, right? Um, number one, I think it is the ability to recognize that civic space is much bigger than the physical realm. And I think as history has shown us over and over, one example I will give is when printing technology became available in South Africa, right? Suddenly you had... Um, publications, anti-apartheid publications that could grow. So one of the longest lasting one South African labor bulletin is still even with us today, um, post 94, you know. Um, throughout history, activists have always been using what the tools available at their disposal to add value to their organizing. And I think the key thing that makes a difference with um, sustained impact is recognizing that Technology is just a tool. It does not replace people. That's the one big difference I have seen between movements that have sustained impact and those that end up just being viral um, short-term sensations, that you do not replace people with tools. But yes, you use all of the tools at your disposal to make the changes that you want. The other thing that you also see is that... Um, the dire, it, it, it's the ability to um, turn the tide on mechanisms that um, enable clampdown on civic space, right? Um, so this could be the use of encryption technology to um, use um, platforms that are restricted in a particular country, which is quite similar to what anti-apartheid um, activists did in the past. And the reason I, I just keep bringing up this old use of technology is just to remind us that Yes, the technology and how it manifests is very different, but some of the challenges we are facing with it are not particularly unique, right? In the same ways that anti-apartheid activists use the printing technology to publish publications, to print posters and organize at a different scale, reactionary actors were also using them to... Um, propaganda, you know, for propaganda reasons and so on. And so I want us also to be careful of often exceptionalizing this moment that we are in, because I think these crucial lessons that we could learn from the past that could inform and build up, you know, how we're responding to this changing landscape. Yeah. Yeah, danke, Kuketsu. Ich bleibe jetzt bei dem Deutschen, dann ist es besser mit dem Publikum. Thank you, Kuketsu. I want to come back to the question of effect. On one hand, you say that maybe it's not that different than printing bulletins uh, during the anti-apartheid struggles. But still, I want to ask, we saw worldwide during the pandemic that in varied forms, and we had a conspiracy narrative massively spreading in the digital space that were that went over to the real uh, the real world as well and that became movements 
that in a very problematic way connected to right-wing movements in Germany, for example, and also in South Africa, they are uh, connected to xenophobic movements and other movements that are problematic. So what's your analysis on that or your perspective on that? Why did that happen? How would you describe that? And what would be counter strategies? What's your perspective on that? Who wants to? I would like to ask this question to you too, to you both. Who wants to start? Poketsu? Um, I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go. Um, so, yeah, it is very different in terms of how it's manifested and the more sophisticated ways in which it can be used, without a doubt, you know. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that it is exactly the same as print technology. But I think one of the things that I want us to also remember, and I want to give an example. Um, when news broke about how uh, Donald Trump had harvested um, data using Cambridge Analytica, right? You saw a lot of the sense of, oh, you know, Cambridge Analytica, the algorithms made it... Um, racist. Um, but the reality is Cambridge Analytica and the rations didn't create racism or misogyny, right? The racism, misogyny and the xenophobia that made Trump's election possible existed before any interference or data harvesting, you know? They existed. All that was done was how do you take an existing problem and amplify it, you know, deepen it and make it worse. In South Africa, we had our own situation, a company called Bell Pottinger, which was a London-based PR firm um, with a long history of serving dubious clients, was hired um, by a uh, family to pave the way for our state being captured, right? Um, and the campaign that they had entailed using real people, Twitter bots and websites in an effort to portray the family as victims of some kind of smear campaign to hide the looting um, that the family was undertaking in the country. Um, individual journalists who were reporting on their corrupt deals were also targeted um, directly with the messaging, right? But despite the crude tactics employed by this company, their campaign contained elements of truth which made people more susceptible to their messages, right? Um, so, for example, we do have a big racist, racial inequality in the country. By combining elements of truth with any propaganda campaign, people are much more likely to be susceptible to it, right? For example, in South Africa, over 30 million of the 55 million population are living in poverty, right? Um, but poverty amongst white households remains largely unchanged at around 1%. And black South Africans still earn significantly less than their white counterparts. So these are, um, these are ways in which these nefarious agendas are being enabled by very real structural injustices. And so it's crucial that as much as we are thinking about how to deal with it at that platform digital level, we also need honest discussions about um, the realities and injustices in which we live, right? And there's the need to confront these. Um, the algorithms which we are talking about don't just create themselves. They are created by human beings who exist as part of these structures, right? An algorithm is not just racist by accident, you know? And these are some of the things that we really, really do need to, you know, engage a little bit deeper on. That the things that we are seeing online are replicating, amplified, and we are actually reproducing a lot of what is not online in and of itself, you know? The, um, we can't ignore the targeted campaigns, particularly that women journalists and activists are facing online, are not separate from the misogyny that women experience every day, you know, um, in offline spaces. But the two have come, you know, there is no pure offline, there is no pure online. They are so, so deeply intertwined. How we target, you know, um, has changed, but yeah. We, we, are, we are in a time where we have to confront the racism, the misogyny, the economic inequality in which we exist, you know, um, that is taking us one step closer. I also do want to elevate the fact that these 
we see these things and, and it's part of this program of depoliticization that Tobias was talking about, right? That we separate these very real structural things from what is happening with algorithms online, with data harvesting and so on. You can't, you know, all it does is it serves these major platforms. It encourages the major dominance of these players um, the moment we do that. And we also have to, Tobias mentioned this, you know, the collusion that we are seeing between these private companies and governments, repressive governments, for example. Um, a telecoms company, we've been, as a Mobi, we have been doing a lot of work around the cost to communicate in South Africa because low income consumers pay so much more for data costs right and part of the reason this exists is because we have this duopoly of the major networks right um that determine so much of who can access who can't afford and so on one of those companies right now in swaziland um they've been major protests that have been happening and at the behest of the government um they shut down the internet there right and so it's also just we can't even talk about the private actors as separate from the government actors because the two are permanently colluding to create this repressive environment and this clamp down in civic space of which we are talking. I'll end there and hand over to you, Tobias. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to Usha's initial question, right, about conspiracies and misinformation and the pandemic. And I think this really needs... Um, localized answers, uh, because uh, I think it's a confluence of actually quite different social phenomena that now sort of unite in a very strange way. First of all, I think, and I'm, I'm not speaking for Germany or like Europe, um, there have always been people dubious about vaccines, right? There, there have been people who are anti-vaxxers. There have been people who have always been suspicious about medicine and so on. And they've been quite fragmented and maybe also um, on the periphery of many discourses. And now the pandemic gave them a reason to unite, to interact with each other. And of course, digital media helped that a lot. So digital media is good at bringing people together also people with weird worldviews, right? Um, that's one thing. The second thing is the media logic. Media needs attention, right? And a headline like a million people have been vaccinated and they all didn't get ill. And another million people have been vaccinated and they didn't get ill either. And another million has been vaccinated and they didn't get ill too. That becomes boring, right? But Vaccinated people get infected. <gasps> right? That's a shocking headline. Same. All scientists agree. You can write that. And then you can write it the next week and next week. That becomes boring. But scientist X has a quarrel with scientists. Why? That's, that's something new, right? And, and we've seen a lot actually in the media of what we call in communication science false balance, right? You need a discourse going on and to create that discourse you need opposing positions and that makes it look as if both opposing positions had the same backing in society or in a, a scientific community which was not the case very often a very very broadly agreed opinion was debated by somebody with a really fringe opinion just to create what looks like a discourse but which is actually a false balance and the third effect is that actually here in Europe, with the lockdown, with the measures, many people who are so privileged that they never had the experience of having to stop doing things that they're used to, had to do that for the first time in a very long time. And we have lots of people here that live very luxurious lives who can just do what they want. And that stopped. And of course, there are many people, both here and in other countries, for whom this is a daily experience. But for some, it was new. And they became very, very angry about that, right? Because they're just not used to it. It was a real confrontation with privilege being taken away for the sake of others, right? 
Because, and that's the last point, unfortunately, the pandemic quickly became into something or turned into something very abstract. In the beginning, we had those shocking images and nobody was sure what's happening. But in our countries right now, there are people dying daily, right? But it's just a number in the, in the, in the newspaper. Right? A thousand people died, a hundred people died, whatever. This is people dying. An entire city has died in Germany, a big city. But that's just a figure. It's so abstract for many people. And at the same time, the impact of the measures is not abstract. You have to care for your children. You can't work. Your, your, your job is on the verge of being bankrupt. Right? That's uh, your job, your, your enterprise. That's all very concrete, but the, the, the disease can be far away. And here we see an interesting um, imbalance in what the media can transport and what they can't transport, right? Death and so on turned somehow into a figure, into something very abstract. But other things did not. And it's very hard to actually understand why, I said the, why that is the case. Um, but I think those are a, a couple of the many factors that all work together in creating this new weird movement, which then, last factor, was immediately and readily taken up by very extremist groups in our societies who had just waited for that occasion, right? And organized and jumped in. So that's maybe my um, very like preliminary explanation, because I think this also needs much more research and more profound understanding. Thank you very much. That's of course uh, the huge area. I would like to hand over to Jule and just uh, tell us what kind of questions are in the FNQ question or what, what the people, listeners are asking to you. Jule, do you want to share with us? Ja, hallo, zurück. Ähm, und zwar gibt es bis jetzt nur eine Frage. Yes. Um, up until now, there's only one question, but it's loaded. It's from Francisca Biara. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Tobias, you said that the work of politics starts mainly when the work of science to put facts on the table, what you said, the reason of the work of reason stops. So, uh, Francisca asks if effective behavior is so individual, how can politics give an appropriate response? Or is polit making politics not also, does it not also consist of effect? Does it not only have to respond, but also to engage with effect? So maybe both of you can answer this. Um. First of all, maybe I should qualify my statement, right? Um, because it's not the case that politics is affect and science is ratio, right? Uh, there's a lot of affective stuff going on in science too. And actually that's how science works. So that's affectivity is part of the scientific quality insurance, if you want. Like if, if scientific achievement, for example, would not have affective, elements to it, if you wouldn't be proud to it, and if, if you did something bad as a scientist, for example, fake a study, if that wouldn't come with effective consequences like shame, science wouldn't work as well as it does, right? So it, it has effective things too. But there is a, 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 a fundamental misbelief in our societies that Truth speaks for itself, right? Truth needs no power. Truth is the opposition of power. That's the old enlightenment dream, right? I speak truth to power, right? So if I speak the truth, I don't need power because I, I have the truth. And if I speak the truth, I don't need affectivity because I have the truth. And we see right now that the truth doesn't speak for itself. The truth needs its own climate, a cultural and effective climate 
to prevail. And we need to build that cultural ground, if you want to, on which truth can be distributed. And we see that because the truth, for example, about vaccination is out there. It is known and people can read it, but it doesn't affect them, right? It doesn't make them change their minds. It doesn't, for a lot of people, it does, of course, but for many and too many still, it doesn't touch them. It doesn't make them change. And that's the work I've been talking about. And that is work, of course, that scientists, when we now speak about, like um, epidemiologists or virologists cannot do. Scientists, when we speak about physicians, of course, they can do that, right? They can speak to the patients. They can tell them. They can interact with them also on an effective level. But politics needs to do that too. And now to come to the question. I emphasized that affect is a thing which is politically, socially, and culturally situated. To oppose it very strongly to that behaviorist idea that all humans work the same and that you can just measure a human and treat it appropriately. But when I say affect socially, culturally or politically situated, that means that some of it is individual. That's just your biography. That's just the experiences you made. But a lot of those experiences are actually shared along certain lines, like, for example, race or gender or class. So it is the case that certain groups, or maybe also smaller groups like intersectional theorists have pointed out, may, some experiences are just shared by black women, for example, or by migrant women or queer men, whatever, right? Like uh, smaller groups. But those are groups that we can understand and we need to understand and speak to them, right? So politics, to do the work of politics cannot just be to talk to the people. It needs to understand that situatedness of affect. And actually, those whom we accuse of manipulation or of advancing often right-wing or other misogynist or racist views very often understand that very well, right? That's part of the secret of the Brexit campaign and the Trump campaign to speak to very concrete individual, yeah, effective predispositions in certain areas of, of society. And it is a misunderstanding that those who are on the right side, those who are on the side of truth, need not do that. They need to do that as well. And I think that I think that's what I that's what I wanted to say. They also need that sensibility for those social and cultural and political differences. Yeah, danke. Koketsu. Thanks. Would you like to say something? I just wanted to say we plan to continue for another quarter an hour. There's a little back and forth. Is this an academic or is it a physical unit? So we will continue until a quarter to eight. So, Kuketsu, uh, please do continue. So Tobias has raised a whole range of um, very interesting things, right? And one of the things about mis and disinformation is it speaks to also an environment of distrust, you know, in an age um, um, in deep media distrust, um, that there are no reliable um, sources of information. And we do see it... Um, 
we do see it spread by this both sidesms, you know. I will never forget there was one headline that went quite far here in South Africa and how inadvertently media also plays a role in the spread of misinformation. There was a headline, if I remember, it was somewhere in the UK, but the headline was the first person who got vaccinated there has died. This was an elderly man. He could have died of anything, you know, but the headline was that first person vaccinated is dead. And this headline spread quite far and wide. Many people saw the headline. Most people didn't need to read the news, right? And so the clickbait as well and how it creates this environment that is ripe for mis and disinformation is quite um is also something that needs to be understood. And that mis and disinformation does not happen in and of itself. Um, there's a book called Lie Machines, How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Junk News Operations, and Political Operatives, right? It gives you very nice insight into different mis and disinformation campaigns and initiatives about how they operated. You spread news in this way. It was amplified in this way, right? And one of the things we are increasingly seeing is that um, sometimes the ways in which we debunk um, some misinformation that is going on, actually, if I read, quote, tweet it with the truth, I've elevated that thing to be seen by more people than it would have been seen. Um, so there's this entire ecosystem that is at work here. And I go back to we are not doing enough. Um, and I think this is why projects like the African Digital Rights Network and so on are so important. We're not doing it enough to understand it in how these um, campaigns play out in different parts of the world. So even with Trump, when we talk about Cambridge Analytica and some of what happened, it's almost as if it just happened. But what we do know is the work that was done for Trump by Cambridge Analytica was first tested in Kenya, right, as part of the Kenyan election. Um, yeah, so how these things operate in different parts of the world, the questions we should be asking ourselves, and the fact that dis and misinformation don't just spread. There's ways in which well-meaning people amplify it and let it be seen by others. There's ways in which um, a distrust in news and news sources, right, for a variety of reasons, rightfully or wrongfully so, um, also plays a role in this. And so we should ask ourselves about this in this climate, this overall climate that is created that enables this to thrive. The other thing that we cannot ignore, and I think in a country like South Africa, we just recently had a local government election. Um, Herman Mashaba, who used to be a mayor, the mayor of Johannesburg, a known xenophobe, a known Trump lover, you know, he is um, making what are very dangerous ideas mainstream. He has started a political party, and this political party did very well in our last elections. And what we are seeing is this um, vacuum in leadership that we are seeing in many, many political spheres, um, the deep inequality is creating a vacuum in leadership that right-wing forces are filling up. And this is not just starting now. A COVID happened, it was unexpected, but the right-wing forces have been organizing so long that when a moment like COVID came, they were able to seize it, right? So one example is you look at some of the laws that were passed, right, um, as COVID was happening and our attention was being diverted by this crisis. You think about um, Hungary, um, which passed a very anti-trans bill, right? Removed the recognition, essentially, of trans people there. Yeah, the, the, the pandemic was used as a cover to do things that have long been built up. Dangerous ideas that were enabled by people like you and I, by media, you know, that were able to become mainstream and normalized um, have suddenly had currency. But I really encourage you to read this book. There's a lot of um, good work being done to help us understand how these campaigns um, are being run, are being operated. And you'll find that um, 
the similar similarities and the differences are so stark right depending on what the end goal is as well and i really appreciated what tobias was saying this idea that the truth will just speak for itself you know um i want to give an example of the limits of transparency over the years there's been this big push even in the civic tech world right this idea of let's create an, an app or let's do this and this which will make government more transparent transparency in and of itself knowing what is going on has not given the push for more to be done right um just knowing isn't enough you know there is links that are missing right there where we think that yeah this thing can just end here whereas other forces are taking it much much further and therefore they are able to seize moments like covid to push what are very very dangerous agendas and some of this legislation that i'm talking Thanks. about you know just this clamp downs and so on we should be careful that it does not become permanent um Thanks. otherwise we'll have regressed Thank you very much. I just thank you. I know we run out a little bit of time, but I still want to hand over to Yule for some last question round. So before we we have to close, Yule, can you please um, help us with what other questions came up so that we continue? Thank you. Um, ich wollte eigentlich ein bisschen cheaten und eine eine Frage vorstellen. I just wanted to cheat a bit, actually to and uh, ask another question but now i have two more don't really know what to do though okay i have a question though you just said um there are also right wing networks that organize themselves so algorithms are not racist by themselves so they are coming out of racism so a lot of left-wing people try to do politics and they have more or less um, success but you could maybe say what happens in the world is a class fight class struggle um, from above so if we speak about digital activism do the other have a better approach to that or what should we as left-wing activists do to change this so the question was actually about isolation in the in the beginning of this lecture is isolation a subject that plays a role so that people organize themselves so that they organize themselves in the internet to break this isolation are right-wing people doing it better than we do and how could we improve and what role is is isolation playing in the whole thing yeah i think your connection, your question connects to what I said in the very end of why those algorithms are not neutral. And one of the issues is, as I said, that the current platforms, the way they're built right now, right, completely subscribe to that liberal individualist idea. You just mentioned class, right? Class struggle. And there is no class on the platform. There's just individual and their individual tastes, desires, likes, shares, whatever. It's, it's, it's a completely individual logic, right? And you can, on Facebook, you can say what your favorite books are. You can say what your gender is. And you can say that in a very complex way. There's no class. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit here, right? But you can't say that's why, that's why class. Um, but that's, I think that's the issue, right? Um, it is an inherently individualist logic, and that's all the problem of some organizing. So when it goes wrong, or when it, or when it just becomes that quick viral explosion that just vanishes without any substantial consequences, it is because it is this individualized thing. Everybody contributes individually without forming something socially coherent and the, the problem is that achieving that social coherence is possible on those platforms but the inner logic is opposed to it because it's so individualist and i think that also speaks i'm too brain to be brief because of time that speaks to the loneliest thing right because it again is what you experience Time and again, algorithms tell us is an effect of what you did. 
I measure you, I give you the feedback. And that, of course, just continues a way in which we treat a lot of things in society right now, right? Your career is an effect of what you did. Your pension is an effect of how well you prepared your pension. Your health care is an effect of how well are you behaving, right? We are, we are individualizing everything. That is, that is a main strand in our society. Um, and so we also tend to individualize coping with the pandemic, which makes people lonely. And so I think both reactions or both questions are actually related via this individualist logic that drives a lot of parts of our societies right now. Yeah, thank you very much. I think before I want to hand over to Kokezo, um, I wanted to ask Julia again to just add maybe some of the other questions, which are also kind of comments, so that we, we, we just know what the public has said. And then maybe Kokezo, you can choose where, where, what you want to pick on, where you feel what you feel is most important to add on. Yeah, I'll hand over to Julia now. Okay, hello again. Um, ich würde jetzt okay, hello again. I would like to summarize. There's two questions that are about an effective support of making politics. So do we need a bigger sensitivity towards effect? And to what do we come from? Where do we come from? In, from which position do we make politics? Do we do politics? So with an understanding of solidarity and second question, in how far could we learn from that and do politics better, not more manipulative, but better if we would listen to effect a little more. So, you know, the, the questions which are being asked, right? Um, solidarity has happened in this world before. We've overcome some big, big things in this world. You think about slavery, you think about apartheid, you think about, you know, these historically many things that have been overcome. What are the ways in which we could translate those solidarities, right? And help us think about how we do movement building right now. And one of the things I often find is that, like I keep saying, I gave you many examples of technology being used for good, but also for bad. And this just shows that technology in and of itself is neither good nor bad per se, right? What matters is the prevailing social order um, that shapes the technology and uses it to maintain the status quo and advance the interests of certain powerful folk. And I, I want us to think about when we use tools, part of the thing about organizing, we think about the work, the work, this needs to be jump in. Are we doing enough work to shape our values? What holds us together, right? If we're going to do this movement work, what is shaping the values that hold us together and enable us to hold each other accountable, right? And which should also inform what technology we are using for whom, you know? Um, what are we doing to sh reshape all of that? What are the ways in which people have shown solidarity in the past? I think it's very really easy to think of yourself and your organization as being at the center of the world. The reality is that we are on the periphery. We are challenging powers and systems that have so much more capacity, so much more resources than what do, than we do. What makes us powerful is us collectively coming together with a shared values, a clarity of purpose and a shared vision, right? And when I talk about future, I'm not talking about one singular future, I'm talking about futures as future making as we build this movement. Because in all our individual spaces, which are collective spaces, there's something to be done. I am able to protest because there's somebody who's looking after my kids, right? That in itself is a collective way of action. We are able to contribute differently from our research perspectives, from our 
arts, artistic skills, using all of the different tools at our disposal, but not replacing people with the tools is such a key, key thing. And I want to just end off with the COVID-19 crisis has just shown us just how critical digital technologies have become. And the reality is they can be a powerful tool in the struggle for a more just post-pandemic world. But they are also a formidable weapon in the world, in the hands of those defending injustice. And we are at a point where it is going to be crucial that we decide how do they want us, how do we want them to be used, how are we going to allow them to be used, what are the ways in which we can push back on this, and what are the ways in which we can advance um, a much better post-pandemic society. Yeah. Uh, vielen Dank, Koketsu. Ich glaube, das war ein... Thanks a lot, Koketsu. I think that was a wonderful closing statement. I think we could continue for a long time now. It's always a search or an experiment to invite people like you two to this digital room together and to approach questions where we have to look for the starting point first to get into a discussion. But I think we brought something together and we um, took a bit of way together and I got a lot of inspiration from that. And I want to thank you again for taking the time and for coming here and um, from you two and from all the audience. Um, I want to say goodbye now and I thank you for um, for listening and for watching for your attention. I would love to see you again at our next lecture, which will take place in two weeks on the uh, in two weeks anyway. Uh, thank you to Jule. Thank you for the interpreters. Thank you for the tech hosts and the crew that helped in the background. Without you, everything would not have been possible. Everything would have broken down yet again. It's just as important as talking and thinking. I'm very much looking forward to the evening.